All right, here we go. Reggie Wright Jr., welcome back to Vlad TV. It's man. been quite a while. Yes, sir. Glad to be to be able to be seen, man. Yes, sir. And we're going to talk about your current situation now. Okay. But I kind of want to just catch up a little bit since last time you've been here. Because the last time you were here, you were about to turn yourself in. Correct. Okay. What exactly did you plead guilty to? Because you didn't go to trial, right? No, sir. Okay, so you pled guilty. I pled guilty to uh, sales of marijuana and money laundering. Okay. And I guess that at one point you had your own, uh, you know, weed shop, right? I did. Dispensaries. I had two. Dispensary. I had one in Gardena. I'm, I'm sorry, Garden Grove mm -hmm. and um, in Lone Beach. Okay. That, um, that I was involved in. And um, that's how I started off in the business. Yeah. Was mainly with the marijuana dispensaries. Okay. But those actually ended up going out of business. Well, the cities, not the feds or the state. The cities kept closing me down, the code enforcement departments, mm -hmm. because cities didn't want it in their communities at that time. And we're talking about 2010, 2011, 2012, mm -hmm. where they were hard, where now they're a little bit more lenient right? Uh, with the marijuana dispensaries. Okay. And I guess after your shops closed down, you continued to do some marijuana business. Uh, yes. And even during it, but mainly when the shops closed. Yeah. That I... Uh, started selling to uh, guys that were shipping it out of town. Okay. And how much did you sell exactly? How many pounds? Yeah. Oh. Hundreds? Thousands? Yeah. Well, Millions? <laughs> it, was, it wasn't that major, but it was three to four pounds a week. Okay. Maybe five pounds a week. Okay. Uh, that were going out of town. Got it. How did that whole thing unravel? Like, who got caught that basically led back to you? I was dealing with... Uh, some gang members, mainly in the state of uh, Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I was dealing with some guys that um, were associated with some guys from Watts called the Great Street uh, Crips. I only was dealing with mainly two guys from Great Street Crips and Watts. The guys in Memphis, I didn't know yeah. at all. Uh, and so they... Um, they were connected and dealing with guys that was in Memphis. And those who I started the relationship with were the guys in Watts. Okay. So the guys in Memphis got busted. The ATF was on them. Yeah. Uh, for guns and the gang activities, how federal task force gets on you. Yeah. That led back to you. It led back to me. You got arrested. Uh, through, you know, the the, 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 the game, the game members from Great Street. Yep. You got arrested and you got charged. Correct. And you pled guilty. Yes, sir. You didn't try to take this to trial. I didn't try to take it to trial. If you took it to trial, how many years were you facing? Probably about seven. Seven years. Okay. Your dad was tied up into, into this he thing He was tied also. up with it and only because of his love for Reggie Wright Jr. Uh, what I mean by that, he allowed me to have a checking account uh, because I had several checking accounts because that's how I was getting the money mm -hmm. back. But I had this checking account with him 2007 before I even thought about selling some marijuana, mm -hmm. which helped because it showed the pattern that I had the checking account and I was using it and paying bills out of my account, my house note, everything from that account. Yeah. But it was in his name because, quite frankly, I had got kicked out of the Bank of America right. for some reason. And I used a, his checking account. Okay. Um, and so now his he's name tied was on in, it. Yeah, now he's tied into the money. Now he's tied into the money. Okay. Ultimately, what happened to him? Nothing. So they dropped uh, everything. They didn't drop it. I, well, he and I, we had to pay a, a fine of two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Oof. And that was pretty much the money that they figured, or they that that they came up with, that was put into that account. Okay. And we paid it back to the government. But he avoided jail time, which Correct. would have been awful. Yes. Oh, because he's how old? That would have killed me. Uh, he's seventy five now. Okay, yeah. But when all this happened, it was like seventy two. Yeah. Okay. So you pled guilty. I pled guilty. Leading up to the time that you had to turn yourself in, how did you feel? Um, I was scared, and I mean, when I was doing interviews with you, I think I ex expressed to you that I was concerned. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew that I wasn't going to be doing. Major time because, you know, my lawyer was telling me that I shouldn't do no more than three years for marijuana. 
and all of that. It came out, you know, when you first get indicted, how the government comes at you. Like I was doing all type of things, guns, and, but that was people I was associated with had those particular charges on them. Yeah. And it made it seem like I was involved in that. But once, thank God, the investigators investigated and did their due diligence, they found out I was just the uh, marijuana guy. Okay. And how many years did you plead, to, you know, the deal that they gave you? They gave me 18 months and two years of federal probation. 18 months, so only a year and a half. A year and a half. Okay, and two years of probation. Yes. Okay. Well, in the government, I think the judge, because he didn't know pretty much about the deal that was been in place, mm -hmm. once he, the prosecutor told him that I forfeited a quarter of a million dollars, I think the judge was like, okay. 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 <laughs> that first day in prison, uh -huh. When that door closes, yeah, how did you feel? It was um, it was a humbling experience, I guess. Um, had nerves, nerves was kicking in, but I, fortunately, I knew I was at a prison camp. If you know the difference, they have levels. Mm -hmm. They have the USP, then they have uh, well, they have the high max where, you know, your major crimes at. But then they had the USP federal prison. Then they had what they call minimal security prisons. Then they have low security prisons. Then they have prison camps. Ah. So I was at a prison camp. But jail is jail. Prison is prison. Right. You're still in the you're cell. away from your family. Yeah. You still, men are telling you or women are telling you when you're going to lay down and when you can't move and you're moving is constructed. They tell you when you're going to eat, when you're going to take a shower. Well, that's not true, but they have times and stuff. But at the camp, we pretty much had our freedom when you come to the shower, as long as it wasn't during a count or something like that. So you pretty much knew the schedule. You had a lot more freedom than you do, yeah. but you're still restricted. You can only make so many phone calls. You can only call your, your, your family, your loved one during certain times. And so you lose freedoms like that. Well, here you are in this camp, and it's still prison. It's prison. Right, it's federal prison, right? A federal prison. Federal prison. So you're surrounded by criminals. Oh yeah, the, I, I, I've been in prison with bank robbers, uh, people who committed federal arsons, uh, arson, arson, um, all type of crimes. Where I was fortunate enough, people only had 10 years left on their sentence or less. So generally, people that have a see a light or a date at the end of the tunnel, they generally trying to have play fair for the guys that have been in there since for 20, 30 years. They have really worked their way down to get to that a prison camp. And so they were really the type of inmates that was like grown men now, you know, not for the dumb shit, uh, for okay. lack of a better word. Well, you being an ex-cop. Yeah. In there, I mean, number one, there was no protective custody or anything. There's no such thing. So there. everyone is in the same yard, whatever else. Everything. So, so here you are. I mean, yes, these guys. This is a camp, and yeah, these guys have built up to get to here. But still, you know, this is a group of people that don't like cops very much. Correct. And here you are, publicly an ex-cop. Yeah. And you know, Defro Chronicles was running during that time right. while I was in there. <laughs> exactly. And on BT. So they, and then there was guys in there from Compton. Um, was there anyone Kelly? there who you had arrested before? Or? Uh, not arrested, but um, family members or a guy, it was a guy named Bebe from Santana Block Compton Crip that was in there. He knew who I was. Yeah. <laughs> it was a guy, we called him Billionaire uh, Mike. Uh, you know, he had been following all this stuff on YouTube and stuff. So he knew, he knew who I was. Um, people knew who I was. But it's all about respect, man. You give respect out there, they give it back. Okay, so did you have any problems, any I fights? Had one problem. Nothing. One problem. I had one confrontation with a guy from, actually from Bunny Hunters. Uh, he and I became real good friends, but he was beating up and, and not beating up, but he was harassing my, my bunkie, my cellmate, mm -hmm. you know, the guy that was with me. And I had to step in the middle and say, hey, and he like, 
man, we only ones from the, you know, because everybody else in there was pretty much from Blue Sides or Oakland or San Francisco. You grew up in a red neighborhood, and, I, and now you tripping on me. You ain't. I was like, man, this dude ain't about that. He's a good dude. You ain't going to become waking him up, harassing him while I'm over here with them. And so other than that. No problems. No no conversations. How much time did you end up spending? Uh, 13 months. 13 months. You got five months off. Uh, well, yes. I got two months off for the, the good time that you get off. Mm -hmm. The other three months was supposed to be in the halfway house. Uh -huh. And um, or home confinement. And uh, so I was supposed to be there from November the 4th of 2020 until uh, February the 1st. But I was scheduled for what they call home confinement uh, during any any of that time. Well, I was uh, about to get home confinement. And then unfortunately, this thing called the coronavirus hit me while I was in there. Okay, so you you end up catching COVID, correct? Near the end of your halfway house stay, or well, the beginning, the beginning, be of halfway a house month within, a month, a month in, yes. And uh, you know you were a lot heavier back then as saying. well. Like, how much did you weigh at that point? Three forty eight. Three forty eight. You didn't lose weight while you were locked up at all, or not? I did. <laughs> I was working out, walking three <laughs> miles a day. I was got down to about. 320. I went right. in about 348, 350, right? Okay. Got, got down to about 318 was the lowest I got working. And then COVID came. I mean, the coronavirus, the lockdown came. And just like y'all was locked down, they locked us down in there. Okay. No more working out. They didn't even have us going to work other than people that was like assigned to the kitchen and, you know, cleaning up around the dorms. But they wouldn't let us go on the track. They wouldn't let us work out. We got locked down in there as well. Okay. And so, then I picked it all back up. Yeah. Plus, I got comfortable in there. Yeah. So, you started eating. I was eating. hooked up. You're, you're, oh, you're out of prison. I mean, and, and you I know, didn't go to the, the meal house. They were bringing food to me. <laughs> right. I lived like a celebrity in there, to be honest. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk to guys that have been in prison for a long time, it's funny when, when people talk about the things they miss the most. It's usually not women or television or, or hanging out with their friends. You always hear food. Food. <laughs> food is the most, the biggest thing that people really miss oh, when they're man, locked I was, up. I was dreading, you know, yeah. thinking about steaks. Yeah. <laughs> but to be honest, I was at a prison camp. So occasionally you got those things. Got a little bit. <laughs> so you get out, you gain some more weight. Gain the weight. You get hit with COVID. How quickly does it start to go bad? The COVID? Like, yeah, did you end up in the hospital I, um, right away? Or? I started feeling the symptoms December the 5th. Was when I went and got tested. So I might have was feeling the symptoms around the third or the fourth. Well, I thought it was a bad cold. Called my wife, told my wife, I think I'm catching a bad cold or pneumonia or something. I thought I really had pneumonia because I knew it was bad. Mm -hmm. I didn't think COVID because we was wearing masks around there and they were calling themselves, isolating us from the ones that was getting tested, but they wasn't telling us anybody coming back positive at the prison at the time. But they were. We found out later they were. So I remember I did an interview with this guy, Phil Carson, online on like on December the 5th or December the 4th, the Dozier podcast or something they called it. Mm -hmm. And right then while I was talking then, like I'm talking now, I was feeling out of breath. I was like, boy, I don't feel right. I mentioned all that. I think I'm coming down with this COVID. So make a long story short, the next day I went and got tested, which was December the 5th. Okay. They, uh, at that time, I, now I got a fever. Um, I went to the doctor to get tested. But when I came back, they wouldn't allow me back in there because my temperature was like 101, 102. So they sent me home on December the 5th or the 6th or something like that, whatever that Saturday date was. They sent me home to my family to infect them. <laughs> They sent me home. They finally gave me my home confinement that I thought I was going to get on November the 4th. Yeah. And on the 9th, well, really the night of the 8th, December the 9th, I told my wife, um, and then she had went and got one of those things to check your uh, oxygen level. My oxygen was like in the 80s, which your oxygen should never drop behold 
90. Mm-hmm. And I was in the 80s, maybe going into the 70s. And so about four or five in the morning, she took me to the emergency room in Corona. Went in there. And they immediately took me back in the ER. They did x ray They didn't do the COVID check. They did x-ray. About a couple hours later, doctor came in the room and said, I don't know if anybody told you, but you got COVID and pneumonia. Wow. And your chest is full of it. So they did some treatments. Uh, I was fighting it, trying not to go on the ventilator. They kept begging me. It was like, Mr. Wright, you want us to save your life? And calling my wife, my mother, everybody, trying to talk to him, saying he needs to get on the ventilator. I fought it until about December the 19th. I'm finally now. I thought it was sooner, to be honest. I would have been telling people the 14th, like four or five days later. But I fought it all the way till the 19th, got on the ventilator, didn't wake up until about February the uh, 10th or the 12th. I remember, this is the only thing I remember, waking up and I saw Tom Brady throwing the the Super Bowl, the MVP or the Super Bowl trophy to Gronk on the boat. And I woke up and I was like, dang, Super Bowl? I, you know, I didn't know what was going on. Tampa Bay, because when, when I went in in December, Tampa Bay wasn't doing that well. Right. And I was like, so anyway, um, that's when I woke up. But now I'm paralyzed. Well, had no feelings or anything from my neck down. Couldn't move. Well, you were in a coma for two months? You know, about well, whatever that is, a month and a half, two months. Okay. And they put the ventilator tube in your throat? Well, no, they had it on my neck. That was a trait that they put to help me breathe uh-huh. in my throat. So I had a trait, I had a tube in my stomach. And uh, I um, I was, like I said, couldn't move. The, um, so then I was sent to a rehabilitation place. And that's where I started getting a little bit of strength back. And slowly but surely it's been coming back. But I'm still, you know, about about another 50% to be able to get the strength back. I'm only at 50% still to this day with, as far as my legs and arms yeah. are concerned. Well, you know, we have a doctor uh, that comes on the show, okay. uh, Dr. Khan, who's been treating COVID patients, you know, since day one in Las Vegas. And what he basically said is that when you make it to the ICU, you have about a 50-50 chance to make it out of there. Let me tell you this, lad. December the 27th, they called my wife and told her his body is, in, his blood is infected. Uh, we suggest you take him off the ventilator and let him, whatever happens, happen. Wow. Her and my mother talked, and my sister, they told the doctor no. Uh, no, that's, we're putting that in God's hands, but you're not taking him off the ventilator. A day later he called, she said five or six hours later, it felt like, but probably it was a day later. And so he's doing much better now. Wow. And, uh, you know, we're not going to take him off the bender later. Wow. So your wife could have basically she allowed you to die. And every time she get mad at me, she reminds me of that. <laughs> <laughs> she and she's sitting right that. here next to you, by the yeah, way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She, she reminds me of that every <laughs> Time. Should have let you die, motherfucker. Oh my, that's the exact <laughs> word she used. <laughs> I swear, blood. But I anyway. bet. I bet. Yeah. Okay, so you get out, and you know, I mean, you don't even remember how you even got there. I guess initially, uh, you, you think. I guess you thought you were in a car accident I or I was something. In a car accident. Yeah. And I don't know when I knew it was from you know turn you know going to the hospital for COVID. Okay, but now you're okay. I mean, you're in a wheelchair now. Yes. And, you know, your arms and legs are still not fully functioning, but right. you're alive. I'm alive. And you're, you're able to function. Yeah. I sing a song, a gospel Christian song every morning called Grateful. Yeah. Gratefulness. Right. Grateful. And at the time that you got sick, the vaccine wasn't widely available. So it's not like you're an anti-vaxxer or anything of that sort. Oh, not at all. Yeah. And you young kids that's out there that are older people, whoever, that don't believe that COVID exists, I tell you, it does. And number two, 
please get vaccinated. Give yourself a chance. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're triple vaccinated now. <laughs> I've got Moderna. Now I'm only double. Oh, oh double. Okay. Yeah. Double. Me, me too. I'm yeah. only double. But yeah. as soon as they tell me a booster is available, I'll be the first in line. You're there. Yes, yeah, sir. You're there. Now, you originally helped start the Gangster Chronicles podcast. Yes, sir. With Mob James and Alex Alonzo. At the Actually, time. it was Norman Steele. Norman Steele. Okay. Norman Steel, Al Alex came later? Alex came about three or four shows in. Yeah. At the advice of Norman Steele, who was our, who called me and said, hey, Reggie, I want to do a show about this, 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 and this. I knew I was about to go to prison. I didn't know if he knew my history. So that's why I was setting up James. I was trying to get everybody, because James my boy. That's like my brother. I, I talk here and then throw jabs at him and all of that. <laughs> but I'll kill you behind James. And I told uh, Norm, I said, no, but I think you need to bring James on. You know, let's, let's get James on the show. And he was like, okay, cool. You know, now he'll say that was his plan all the while. But that's not true. And, um, you know, like I had said, James up with Greg Cadians to go out to Australia. They were trying to get me. I can't go out the country right now. <laughs> I'm on an ankle bracelet. Yeah. But James can. Right. And, and he can tell the story the same way I can. You know, and I've had, you know, Mob James on my show, oh. you know, multiple times. He said that when he first saw a picture of you, you know, uh, after that, yeah, yeah. he said he cried. So is he still in the hospital or is he out of the hospital? He's in a rehab right now. Aha. Uh, the last update I had was he was having problems with his 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 limbs, his legs, and his hands. COVID's a motherfucker, especially when you're uh, when you're heavy. Yeah. When you're heavy, uh, you know, like I had mentioned a while ago, that was my uh, you know reason to start losing weight. You right. know, I lost about twenty pounds and I kept it off. And you know what I saw is people that were heavy that got hit with COVID, had it real bad. Man, I you know, cried. And even died sometimes. Right. I cried when I seen a picture of him. I saw First it. And I believe that. Yeah, I believe, I believe it too. about James. Well, you know, you, you help start this podcast, mm -hmm. and then you end up going to prison. Correct. Right? So at that point, you can't, you know, I mean, you called in a couple of times, I remember, but at that point, the podcast has to keep continuing keep without you. Um at one point, uh, MC8 gets brought in yes. to the podcast as well. Uh, and then they end up, you know, signing their deal with Charlemagne's uh, Black Effect well, uh, podcast network sometime later. Okay. Yeah. But why? Okay. Yeah. Right. And you've done some interviews and you talked about, you know, how you felt about Correct. that whole situation. Yeah. So I'll, I'll let you speak for yourself and, you know. Well, in all the press release, you'll see that um, that's when they signed it, it says Reggie Wright, James McDonald, MC8, or Norman Steele. The reason why I don't stand up for Alex, my boy Alex, who I, I still got a lot of respect for, and if I would do a podcast again, he would definitely be involved is because he never signed the agreement with Norman Steele, who's Digital Soap Opera. Uh, it's his network mm -hmm. that we were signed to. Yeah. And so he never signed the agreement. So I understand why they cut him out. Um, well, he, he had left the show at one point. Well, he blames it on COVID. He said because they stopped filming or doing the show, not filming, but, you know, doing the podcast because COVID kicked in and they stopped. When they started back up, it was just Norman and James doing it. They never called him to say, hey, we got to start back up. Now, on their side is he stopped returning their calls. Mm -hmm. But there was issues because Norman was upset that um, Alex wouldn't sign the, uh, the paperwork, you know, the contract with his company, mm -hmm. which I think Alex had a motive there. And I was always the bridge between them trying to keep him because no Alex would have been gone if I, you know, went always, you know, standing up and didn't, you know, I had James here. And so it was like two against three and Norman would, you know, he would say, okay, whatever. But he hated dealing with Alex. They, to this day, don't have a great relationship where 
I still have a good relationship in my mind with Alex, James, and Norman. They signed the deal, and you had made some comments about an alleged advance that Correct. they got. I, I have nothing to do with the Gangster Chronicles. I am in no way in the business and so forth. But you made those comments. Correct. And what, what exactly were those comments? My comments was they should have split the money with three ways. Right. Instead alleg of allegedly two was, ways. Allegedly it was $75,000. So $75,000. Based on was what a, you said. That was, I don't know if advanced is the right word because advanced is recoupable. And so, you know, I know the business a little bit. So I'll say a $75,000 signing bonus. And so using my name, Norman, the whole time I'm in prison telling me, I don't take care of you, which he'd stopped back in February, March. Cause you know, the money was making off of YouTube. We was all three generating about $1,500 a month uh, from about when our numbers got up from about uh, November until about March. I was getting about 15, my wife was, he was giving my wife about $1,500 a month. Mm -hmm. It stopped in March and that was because of COVID and YouTube numbers probably was down. And we wasn't taping any more shows for a while. But then, the whole time I'm calling Norman, and like you said, on the call-in shows, I was still communicating with him. They were telling me, you're gonna be good. We got a deal in the works, this, 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 and this. And so I'm like, okay, okay. I'm telling them I'm about to get out. I'm about to get out because, you know, you hear about the CARES Act and different programs where they're supposed to be, I was eligible for, where I thought I was gonna get out earlier than November. But now they doing interviews with guys that's coming on bashing Reggie Wright, you know, Marvin Kinsey and people like that. So I'm saying, wait a minute, y'all doing interviews with people that's bashing me? Not, I'm calling, y'all ain't answering my call while I'm calling and I know y'all taping so I can respond to this. And so I, I'm gonna be honest, Norman saw the success of the show because it was doing great numbers with Alex, myself, and James. And I believe Norman was like, you even came on with, with us three. Yeah, I showed up on the show. Did it. Yeah. And um, Norman just wanted to take over Alex's position. And I think, I don't know, I can't say he wanted me out of the picture, but they thought I was gonna come out sooner than I was. And I didn't and they had to move on alone. And then that's when they brought MC8 in. But they didn't share the money with MC8 on the, the cash bonus. That was show me, that's why I said, all the success came from Alex, myself, and James that y'all got this deal from. They say no. Well, I talked to James uh, this morning before the interview. Uh, okay. I told him, hey, I'm gonna have Reggie on today. And, you know, he made the comments about the Gangster Chronicles, which we're going to talk about. However, whatever he says, he says, but he said these things before about the bonus and everything else like that. So I just, I wanted to get your take on it. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a one-sided type of thing. And his take was, uh, he's always maintained that he wants you back on the show as soon as you're 100% ready to be back on the show, which, you know, clearly you're not 100% yet. Correct. So that was his take, and he said he has a lot of love and respect for you, and there's no animosity of, of any sort. He told me the same. Yeah. And so and I believe what it. he told you, he told me. Yeah. I'm just saying, you got an advance, or got a bonus, you should have shared it. And I said, that's my opinion. And I said, when I, whenever I say that, I said, that's my opinion. That don't make it right. I just said, that's my opinion. And that's why I was disappointed in them. Yeah, but I, I haven't stopped taking their calls. I still talk to Norman. I still talk to James. And so, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I'm not part of this business at all. So yeah. <laughs> everything to me is, is, is secondhand information. Hopefully, you guys could work it out, and hopefully, at one point, you guys could reunite. Because, like I said, I, you know, I'm not involved in the show, but I feel like my interviews with Mob James helped. I, you know, I believe that. You know, and help myself. that show kind of, and, and you as well, kind of showed whoever that, you know, you guys are viable in terms of, you know, your ability to, to speak about certain topics and everything else like that. And from there, you guys got your own show. And I've always been very happy. And I believe I accredited it, that I believe the, uh, the exposure that myself and James got on Vlad 
helped us build that program. Yeah, man. I, I love it. I love it. I, and, I, and I really yeah. believe that. I mean, I called you. You wrote up something nice about us before yeah. we did an interview that the show was starting. Yep. You was always supportive of yep. us. I showed up to the show. You showed up to the show? <laughs> yep. You don't do many interviews. I don't. You showed up to the show? Yep. And everything. And still, to this day, appreciate it. Yeah. And you've said that you're actually proud of of Mob James' oh. growth and, and what he's done with the show and what he's done with his life. I am. He take care of Whenever you call him and talk to him, you hear a bad little boy in the background. Right, his grandson. His grandson. Right. Yeah. I love that about him. If y'all knew James... In 1990, 80, and 90, and now, know him now, different man. Yeah, I bet. Different man. I bet. What did you think about his whole uh, situation with uh, Charleston White? I was so glad to see. Th and that's when I saw the growth. I mean, I had been noticing it and hearing him say it, but we all say a lot of stuff. But when James sat down and got out of the man face in 1980 and 1990, that wouldn't have happened. Would have escalated. It had to go there. <laughs> yeah. I done been at locations where, as a police officer, when people told me, yeah, you know who did this, but I ain't telling. <laughs> and that was James. So my point is, he would do that to friends, enemies, or whoever, if you went there yeah. with him. Yeah, man. Uh, I mean, I, I love James, man. You know, he's been on my show a bunch of times. So we've always had a very great respect. You know James. Yeah. You don't know Bob James. I don't know Bob <laughs> That's James. What I yeah, I know James. And I love him. And he always corrected me. And it took me a while to understand that. How you say Bob James? I say, Richard, stop calling me Bob James. <laughs> I totally understand the difference now. <laughs> well, uh, Nas dropped uh, Death Row East <laughs> on his new album, uh, King's Disease 2. And... Uh, you actually had some issues with it. Issues that I take it out on Snoop Dogg because I feel as though he gives them the ammunition because he because he has the audience and the say. And I keep just saying that's not how the story went. Okay, well, I mean, Nas talked about a, a few different things. Now he talked about the confrontation that happened Correct. between, you know, his him and Jungle and his crew along with Pac and all the Jersey guys and everything right. else like that. But what what when did that happen? It was an award show? Or? It was after the uh, 1995, uh, I'm sorry, the 1996 MTV Music Awards. Right. That um, about 12 days before Pac died. Yeah. Five to six days before he got shot. Oh. Um, Were you there when that confrontation I, I happened? Was, I was there. Aha. Okay. So describe to me what happened. Well, what happened was uh, Pac and I, they had a little conversation earlier at inside the uh, location. Or he had one with Jungle, the, the brother. Yeah. But anyway, it was next door at this park, uh, Cobra Park or Bryant Park, whichever one next to the Radio City Music Hall. I think it's Brian Park. And it was a big old MTV I gave a, or one of the big record companies had gave a big after party where it was alcohol, food, everything in the park where everybody was just um, in the park, like a big after party, you know, after the war show. And they had just did the interview that we all seen where Pac was bragging, giving it up for Death Row East, starting it up. And... It was a lot of stuff going, press going on and all of that. Pac had a bunch of dudes from Jersey with him, uh, Fatal and Gaddafi, mm -hmm. Mutau. They had all brought a bunch of their guys from New Jersey with them. How many guys did you guys have with you at that point? If you were to guess. At least 50 to 75. Wow. Just yeah. a mob of people. Okay. But Nas from New York and his people, and it appeared to me <laughs> that they had that many as well. Now, they tried to downsize it now. Talking about it was only six of them or nine of them. It wasn't that many of them. But it was tension on both sides. Me and Sugar was off to our side doing something else. We did see a commotion where people, you could tell a commotion was about to start. Sugar knew it was pop. 
We kind of ran and got over there. We weren't too far away from him. By that time, Pac and Nas are talking. It was a little heated at, at the beginning, but I swear to you, Vlad, at the end, those two hugged each other, gave each other a dap, worked it out. Pac turned to Shug, told him that song against, you know, it, we know know it to be against all odds now. He just finally said the song that, well, I'm dissing Nas, I'm going to take that verse off. I'm fucking with this dude. He coming in town in a couple of weeks. I ain't been seeing our album, but it, it was probably just, they were going to do some songs together. Right. For yeah. Death Row East. For Death Row East. Yeah. Or, or with Pop. Yeah, whatever, I, whatever that, yeah, yeah, whatever project that ended up. Whatever playing. project could have been a One Nation, I don't know, but yeah. they were gonna work together, Pac and Nas. But what I mean by that is they worked it out like men. Could have went crazy on both sides, because mm-hmm. any of those guys, if Pac would have told Fatal or or Gaddafi to hell one of them or gave a nod to do something, they would have done it. And I'm sure Nas had guys on his side. That would have been, did the same for him. Yeah. Thank God those two men worked it out. Okay. Well, uh, Nas also mentioned uh, that stretched and set up Tupac. Uh, now, I interviewed, well, I didn't interview, but Vlad TV, um, you know, interviewed uh, Ed Lover. And we talked about that situation. And Ed felt, you know, who's from Queens as well, uh, felt very strongly that, you know, that Stretch did not set up Tupac and that Stretch's death had nothing to do with the the alleged, you know, Tupac setup, you know, that the people thought. They were friends. The friendship and that bond was B.I., God rest his soul, Stretch and Pac. They were all cool, bro. Like, if you've seen the documentaries on Tupac and Biggie, these dudes were, they were tight. So you can't ask somebody to pick a side when you know that what happened to you did not come from that person. Well, I think, didn't Pac mention something about stretching one of the songs, as he did? Um, I mean, from what I understand, Pac was paranoid and felt that that might be a possibility. Oh, he definitely, you know, I, I think, I think from what I understand, cause you know, I, I know the outlaws pretty well. And okay. you know, like, like I'm, you know, I have relationships with people around, you know, who are around Pac. You gotta remember the age at the time. Yeah. Everyone he, was super he kept, young. He kept them, uh, isolated from a lot of things. The outlaws. He treated them like soldiers. Yeah. Like, yeah. And you know, from, from what I was told from people around Pac during that time was that, Pac was just concerned because uh, Stretch knew some of those other guys and he was kind of relaying information, you know, back and forth to try to alleviate things. But the fact that he was talking to some of the guys that they were, you know, like the Jimmy Henchmans of the world and so forth, that that they were kind of beefing with, they felt uncomfortable having him around at that point. And, and I guess, like, there was also something to do with Pac was dissing Biggie and them and, and Stretch didn't want to go along with that because he was cool with some of them dudes as well. Okay. You know what I mean? That's what I heard. But you you have your take only on this. Only reason my opinion is, only reason, because yeah. I don't have no first-hand knowledge of this, is, number one, it happened on the anniversary date of uh, the, the shooting incident at the Quad Studios with Tupac. Yeah. Happened on that, uh, a year to the date. Associate of ours was out there. He came back a day or two later. Pac hugged him like he was Kadada. Hmm. That's all I'll say. Okay. Someone inferring that this guy who he hugged has something to do with Stretch's murder. That's my only reason for believing what I believe. Uh Uh-huh. Got it. We'll never know, probably. Man's dead now, so. Oh, so so the guy who Pac hugged is no longer alive. No longer. So the story probably died along with him. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, Snoop had talked about this incident before. The Nas. The, the, the Nas confrontation. Correct. And I guess you had issue with that because you said Snoop wasn't there. Show me on the pictures. The pictures all there. Snoop was nowhere around that incident 
to, to, to make the comments that he made. He definitely wasn't in earshot of the conversation. I know him and Pac didn't talk after the conversation because at that time, Pac took off when walking down the street. He was so pumped up that night and he never had patience for the limos in any way. And the limos, you know, because it, it was packed. It was packed park. Y'all know New York. Anybody been to New York know how traffic could be and stuff like that. And he just started walking. We were staying at the Exus House on Central Park East. He started walking towards that way, uh, you know, throwing out money, handing out money to people. And um, so I know they didn't talk because from there, Snoop and I, I took him to uh, Angie Martinez show, the radio show, to do the taping where he really infuriated uh, Tupac at. That's when he said he didn't have any beef with Biggie and them. He didn't have any beef with Biggie, that he'll do songs with Biggie. <laughs> um, you know, he was pretty much giving it up to the East Coast, which he should have, because even Pocket used to try to tell everybody and try to say, it's not the East Coast we have a problem with. The certain people on the East Coast and the ones that has an opinion that he has a problem with. I mean, did Pac ever mention really the problem with Biggie? Because Biggie didn't set him up in Quad Studios. Well, he felt that Pac didn't come, I mean, that, that Biggie didn't come and check on him as it's portrayed in the movie and all of that. After he got shot, he never heard from him. And then when he was in prison in New York, he was hearing things that your boy Biggie and them had something to do Who with. Who shot you? Well, you know, and I interviewed Gene Deal, and he said that that Big actually tried to visit Pac uh, after the quad shooting, but they wouldn't let him in. I wasn't around him then, so yeah, I don't know. I got you. But that's what he when he came back to us, and he told us. And then a month after Pac was signed to Death Row, Biggie got on the radio and incited someone to shoot at the trailer. Yeah, I remember that. that yeah. it, me and Trey D talked about this. That they were in. Yeah, Biggie got on the radio and that during the New York, New York uh, video shoot, the, their trailer got shot up from a distance, yeah. From a distance. And let me say this, because um, I said something on another show where I call Doll Pound guys bitches. And when I said that, I wasn't talking about Trey D, Big C style, Joku, or any of them. I was talking about dads and corrupt. When I say dog pound, I just think of those two, uh, but not trading or Big C style or any of them. Uh, because they were in a, the, you know, the trailer when it got shot. I didn't even know Trey D was there until you just said that. Uh, but the ones that was in there. But the security did get them out and get them out of the trailer. And they were very appreciative yeah. of how the security reacted when yeah. that happened. I mean, Biggie played a role in that beef. He 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 wasn't a victim, you know. And that's he, a month after Pac got out of jail. Yeah. So Pac was furious about that. Right, I bet. Um, you had mentioned that, that Tupac took Sally Richardson from Snoop. <laughs> yeah. What's interesting about this story was when I interviewed Gene Deal, he had mentioned that Puffy was messing around with Sally Richardson. That's well. got around. Huh? Yeah, when Puff heard that, what did he how did he react? I think Puff didn't really give two shits and a shake for it. You know what I'm saying? Because you got to realize this kid was a young kid and he was, I'm going to just be straight blatant. He got, he got his girl, Kim Porter, out there. He fucking Sally Richardson. You know what I'm saying? I'm staying in the room. You know, next time we got the presidential suite. I got a room. He got the room. I'm right there. I'm the one who answered the door and everything. So he's fucking Sally Richardson and everything like that. So he's the man. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if this sort of ties into this whole weird situation of... Pac and Puff. Well, I mean, it just seems like women kind of had this role in this beef, you know, from, you know, Faith. Okay. You know, Tupac allegedly sleeping with Faith. You know, Faith claimed that they never slept together, but, but Pac tried to, try to rape her, you know, after doing a show, I remember, in our interview. After you recorded... You know, you were owed twenty five thousand uh, for the session, and you said that you went to to Pac's hotel room, and you know he basically asked for oral sex at that point. Well, in in, in a very um, in a very 
surprising and offensive way for sure. But I mean, by that time, I think it was, you know, it was pretty clear to me that that it, you know, that that was all kind of a, it seemed to me that that was kind of like a plan. Um, you know, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, Gene Deal mentioned that the the real reason he thinks that the beef escalated the way it did was uh, Suge had a picture with uh, Puffy's, Puffy's son. baby mother and, and their Lisa. son with like a caption said, you know, whatever the West Coast doesn't take care of, the East Coast. And had a death row. It was supposed to appear on Source. It never came out. Have you seen this actual photo? I saw the photo. You saw with, the photo. With the baby with the uh, death row chain on. Oh, yeah. wait, 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 wait. So, so <laughs> Suge took a, a picture. It was with Misa, right? Misa. Misa, Misa Hilton Brown. And their son, uh, is, it, is it Justin? Uh, would be the oldest, whichever one was the oldest. Yeah. Not L.B. Shore's son, which yeah. is uh, Quincy. Yeah. Not him. Yeah, but yeah, but that, that was from yeah. a different one. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm talking about... Uh, and we forgot about Sarah, that Pac messed with, and that Puffy and up. Sarah? Um, uh, I can't think of her name right now. I'll think of it later. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So, so they actually had a death row chain around the baby's neck? Yeah. Uh, that's crazy. Yeah. But it never came out. I think the source was going to do something with it, Dave Mays and them. Yeah, but it, it, never, it, it never, never came uh, out. Too right? Long. Yeah. So, so the, there's there's that. You know, like women are being used as pawns in this whole situation. It seems, and it, it's really, really messy. Really messy. <laughs> well, Pac told you on the stage how he feel about it and how he yeah. get back at you. Um, at the House of Blues is what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. Uh. Now you also mentioned a situation uh, with KC and Mary J. Blige and Pac. Yeah, tell me about that. Well, they had a domestic violence at the Peninsula Hotel one night, and she called Pac. And uh, we actually, I don't know how I was Pac because I never was really with him, but I must have was with somewhere with Sugar, and, and we went over to the Peninsula Hotel, and she jumps out of the. I guess it's like a door or something on the side or a window on the side. And this all come running out the hotel on from the side of the hotel. And she jumped in the car and Park took her all away because, you know, Casey was, they were having domestic issue that night. Well, that's interesting because I actually heard a similar story from Be Legit. Oh, Be Legit. And he was, I remember we had, him and I spoke at UC Berkeley. Uh, okay. It was like some Tupac class or something. Uh, and he was telling a story about how he was hanging out with Pac one night in L.A. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if this is the same situation because it sounds so similar. And he said that uh, Mary J. Blige and, and Casey were arguing. You know, he made it sound like it was on the street or, or something of, of that. But they were well, arguing. I don't know they were arguing that, but I Yeah, know. they're arguing and, and Pac pulls over and he tells KC like to to chill out because Mary J. Blige gets around and he had even been with her before and not to stress out or, you know what I mean? Not, not to overreact over the situation because she's basically yeah. for the streets, you know, how you would say these days. Oh, you know what I mean? But was, he would say how like Pac just kept a little too real sometimes. Like, well, I'm wondering if this is the same situation or not. I can't say, but they had numerous incidents because yeah. they both were drug users at the time or, or alcohol. Yeah. Um, and so they had a lot of issues at that time. And we talking about 95. She seemed to be a great woman now, very uh, clean. And, and so I have nothing but love. That's one of my favorite female artists. Oh, yeah. So, but that that story happened. Uh, you have Danny Boy, who was 16 at the time, who now, after listening to him on Art the Dialogue Show, I kind of believe that might have happened. All right. He said that he, he, slept, slept with, he slept with Mary J. Blige when he was underage. When he was sixteen, but but I thought that Danny Boy was gay. Well, he wasn't gay. That hopefully, in the ninety five, ninety four, when he was making the allegations, we talking about ninety four, ninety five. And like I said, I don't know. Who knows? But he had he had kids since then. Um, he had two kids since. Oh yeah, I mean, ninety four, yeah, ninety five. Right. So. Right, so he's probably bi. Yeah. Yeah, and I've, I've interviewed him before. You know, I I think Danny Boy gives some of the best interviews out there. 
Yeah, he got very emotional. Told. Yeah, he yeah. cried at some point, you know. Okay, so, I mean, you mentioned alcohol. And I think you mentioned Michelle A was, was an alcoholic. She, I've been with Sugar to pick her up at Betty Ford before. At Betty Ford? Uh, I think she'd been there twice. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, she was, she had alcohol issues back in the, uh, during 95, 96 there at the time. And you had said that she was trying to make Shook jealous by saying that Pac try to sleep with her? That was my opinion. For her to bring it to her, knowing that how close Suge and Park was, and she, we had left, and they had to fly back on a commercial plane. We had left on a private plane and left them, and I think that was her way of getting back at them because they were messing around secretly at the time. Who? Suge and Michelle. Michelle a. Yeah. Uh, people didn't know about it. Well, I, I remember. Uh... I seen a video of everyone in the studio with like Tupac was there and Michelle A looked like she was really coming on to him. She was like rubbing on him and, and stuff like that. I don't believe that was her intentions on like coming on to him. She was just affectionate like that. Mm -hmm. um, she was in the studio. Women be a little looser when they're in the studio and you're working around that by. There's usually alcohol and marijuana around. But she knew if she would have did that with Pac, it would have been a one-time thing. And she was taking good care of her at that time, and Dre wasn't. And so she knew her water would have been cut off if she would have found out that she had slept with Pop. So I don't believe she was doing that. I mean, when Michelle A. and Shug started to mess around and they ultimately had a baby together, considering that she also had a baby with Dre, I mean, it doesn't get much messier than that. Yeah. People think um, the reason Dre left Death Row was behind all the drama and all of that. But it was part of it. Dre and DJ Quick were the two I can always say hated that atmosphere that was going around. Hated it. But I think the straw that drew the camel for Dre was when he found out that Sugar and Michelle was messing around. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, even though he <clears throat> was already in a relationship with Nicole. Yeah, but still. But it still hurt your business partner. You, you have a baby with this woman. Exactly. So you really are never going to oh, be totally fully understand. separated from her. You totally know, y'all y'all have a kid together. Totally. Um, and it just it just really blows my mind that that Suge would do that. I mean, out of all the women that he had access to. I mean, he was he was a rock star at the Let time. Let me say this about Michelle and Suge's relationship. The man fell in love with her. Is that what it was? He really did. Huh. He called this woman his wife. Mm. he treated her I was in charge of like I said cutting the checks and all of that I used to give this woman 50 to 75 thousand dollars a month while he was in prison wow wow okay that was love back then yeah I bet I bet we did an album on her that I think debuted 8,000 but she was still getting these type of events she dropped an album on death row? Exactly. <laughs> I didn't know that. It's called Hung, Jur Hung Jury. I did not know that. She this. had a ring around her neck, a necklace with a ring around that was her, her, her married, ended up being her, her engagement in her married band. Oh, wow. It's called Hung Jury. Okay. Yeah, death row priority. <laughs> yep. What the hell? 1998? How, how did I miss this? I mean, I'm a Chalet fan. Like, yeah. I, I bought her first album. Okay. All right. I learned something new today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I did an interview with Gene Deal. Okay. Did you, you get a chance to watch that at all? I'm sure I watched pieces of it. Pieces of it. I uh, watched the first part of it, and the first thing that started off on it was a lie. And I. Which was what? He's. You said. He's one of the guys that chased down the car that shot at. Biggie. At Biggie. Mm hmm. In the same interview, he goes and says, he goes and pull Biggie out of the car. He knew he was dead because he had defecated on himself. Yeah. That ain't the word he used, but yeah. that's what he meant. But then he jumped in the car. I guess now this is what he wanted us to believe. After that, he wouldn't pull Biggie out of the car. Notice all that. Then he went chasing after the car in the hills. Anybody that been in that area, no number one, there's no hills over there, Roy. Um, 
And number two, that just take a lot to go pull somebody out of a car, just got shot, all the excitement going on, realize that he had did what he did on himself, and then got in another car and went chasing after the car to shot at him. And I was like, nowhere in India, you talk to Mike Dorsey, who's been doing that deep dive thing. Mm -hmm. Have Gene have ever said he chased after the car? But he said they agreed with you. And said he said that. And I know Gene this. I didn't caught him in so many tales from conversations that he and I didn't have privately to things that I know from, you know, from the reports from the LAPD or whatever, from hearing it, where I just think he just says what the audience wants to hear. Well, in the deep dive, we go into the, the various theories about how Biggie gets killed. Okay. And, uh, you know, the, the story that first started to circulate was that, that a, a guy that was dressed like a Muslim shot Biggie, a guy, you know, who ultimately was, you know, uh, pinpointed as Amir, Amir Muhammad. And, you know, the story very much differs. You know, like, for example, I could say I know what happened in Tupac's murder. Okay. Right after the Keefe D interview and everyone else I've interviewed and all the stories fit together perfectly. It makes sense. I know for a fact that someone in that car killed Tupac. Correct. Now, it, it, now I'm not sure if it was Dre or if it was. Orlando. I don't know if it was Orlando. I don't know if it was Dre. I don't know if it was Keefe. I don't know if it was the other guy. You yeah. know, there was four guys Tyrone. in the car. T Bone, Nicole. T Bone, right? You know, I don't know. You know, the, the one thing I did hear from witnesses that were there that they saw a a big bulky arm, st you know, That's stick out of the yeah, st yeah stick out of the car and start to, to spray the car up, you know, spray Tupac's uh, BMW up, Shug's BMW that Tupac was in, um, that it was not a skinny arm like how Orlando was built. Yeah. But then again, this is chaos and who, gunshots. Yeah, who, who knows? Who knows what really happened? But I could tell you. I am 99.99% .99 sure that that car, was one of the people, one of the four people in that car killed Tupac. Yeah. I'm hundred percent sure of that. Okay. The Biggie situation, I don't really know. Exactly. The stories are too convoluted and there's no real like, okay, here's the story and here's all the other pieces that fit together with that story. You know, people like Gene Deal and, you know, he also claimed that like Lil C's said a, a quote, Muslim shot Tupac. Um, you know, whereas you talk to other people like yourself and Mob James, Mob James in our last interview said that if you were a Betty man, he would say that uh, Pucci, Pucci, Pucci was the, the one that Falls. killed, yeah, yeah, was the one that that, that killed, uh, that killed Biggie. Correct. And you know, and he went on to say certain people in that crew were known for certain things. Pucci was known to be a shooter. Did you know Pucci though? Oh, I know. I, I arrested Pucci before. <laughs> You've arrested with a assault weapon. And a large quantity of, of, of cocaine. Okay. He used the name uh, something Bolton, his alias name. That's mm -hmm. the only reason I feel he got probably got out. But I had arrested him before. Okay. Uh, about a year or two before that. Um, that incident. Well, no, 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 that's not true. A year or two before I started working at Death Row. Okay. Which is like 95, 96. Was Pucci under investigation for murders at all? None that I know of. Um, but he was suspected and he was known to be a shooter because he was close associates associates with a guy named Little Knob and um, George Williams, George G, who were around. Mm -hmm. And those three, I wouldn't have turned my, my back on because they were the type of guys. Was but they weren't the types that y'all see in pictures that often or being around yeah. with Shook. They would just come around periodically. And so that's why James was saying the difference of the type of guy. You had some guys that was there every day, like Buntry, mm -hmm. uh, Big Jake until he he died. Uh, um, um, who else used to travel with us a lot? Like Juju at his time. You had people like that. Um, then you had guys that came around recently. Then you had people like James. Mm -hmm. who came around for special events mm -hmm. when it was large parties and you need numbers. And so yeah. that's what James mean by everybody had a role. Well, we had posted a deep dive uh, okay. about this 
you know, about the particular case about Amir Muhammad, uh, Psycho Mike, Psycho. And, and and Russell Poole, who was sort of in charge of the investigation. Oh, man, I love time. that. Because it made Russell Poole look like the detective he was. Did you know Russell Poole? Never met him. Never met him. But Russell Poole was sort of the main force behind the, the Biggie conspiracy Correct. shooting and so forth. And Russell Poole felt it was Amir Muhammad. Uh, well, David Mack, really. But Amir Muhammad for David Mack because of the crooked Rampart cops. Right, is exactly. What believe. Yes. Exactly. And once we did the deep, you know, we put out the deep dive and, you know, Dorsey really went through everything. He kind of showed that the people that were pointing the finger at Amir Muhammad were basically crazy people in prison. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> people with, with, you know, documented serious mental conditions. That were lying. Yeah. That had been in custody and was trying to get out of jail. Right. Do anything they could to either get some perks or to get out of prison early. Right, exactly. I mean, going through this, I, I could see the holes in this theory. Oh, that's why I throw jabs at Russell Poole. Ultimately, ultimately, at the end, he got it right. Which was? But who he believes was responsible for the, the shooting of Biggie. And he thought it was who? I don't know. You know. Poochie? <laughs> Poochie. Yeah. No. No? Shug. Oh, exactly. Okay. But building up to that, you know how we used to get in trouble with Mal and the teacher said, show your work? Yeah. He didn't show his work right. Right. Well, we had put up another uh, deep dive episode where we talked about the, um, the Impala. Right? Because there was, you know, essentially the witnesses were all saying that Impala was the one that shot up Biggie's car. They raided my house behind of Impala. Right. Yeah. And they found Impala in, in Keefe's, uh, you know, backyard. Correct. They realized it was not related. The the color that people were saying was, was slightly different. People were saying black. Some people were saying dark green. There was cars that were like burgundy and so forth. But this was at night. It was a chaotic yeah. situation. But then at the end of that deep dive, he had posted some pictures that showed an Impala at parked stop. at Suge's auto body shop. Now, is that is it the same Impala? We're not saying it is. Well, I mean, no. Mike Dorsey didn't say it is. I wasn't he involved never, in this yeah. thing. But, you know, it, it is it is suspicious. It makes you raise your eyebrow. Yeah. And when I say my house got raided, they, I'm the one that turned, they duped me into turning in Suge's Impala. So you're the one that said that the Impala was over there? No, 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 no. <laughs> the Burgundy mean? Impala that was sugar, the one with the rims and all of that? Yeah. I had possession of that Impala. Oh, okay. I was getting it transferred over to uh, one of his friends' name. I forget. Mr. Lay's name. Okay. I was getting the transfer from Death Row or Suge's name to Mr. Lay's name. And um, they had the guy that I was using, uh, the DMV, uh, um, it was like a, uh, you know, a company that did transfers of titles over mm -hmm. for you. They had that guy tell me that DMV wanted to come down and inspect the car. When it actually was LAPD detective, Russell Poole wanted possession of the car. Okay. And so luckily to me, I didn't have them come where I had the cars were because that's where I had all the shit cars. But I had it towed from that location to the office. And that's at that time when they raided my house, Mr. Lay's uh, mother's house, or grandmother's house, and death row offices. And you can see on the news and the camera, <laughs> the car pulling up while they raiding the location. The car on the tow truck because the news was out there and everything <laughs> <laughs> pulling up. And okay. it was just all a, a ruse to get the uh, the car there because okay. they wanted to check it for ballistics and stuff. And did they check it? They checked it for ballistics, took it in custody for about a week, and they released it to us. Okay, so they found nothing. There's they found no, nothing. no residue or whatever nothing. else. So chances are that Impala had, was not the had same Had nothing Impala. to do with it. Okay. And that she wouldn't have gave me permission to release it because, you know, anything I did, I got permission. So uh, my point is, if he thought that Impala was involved, or he allowed somebody to use it, he would have told me, "No, don't, don't, don't." 
Yeah. You know, get rid of that car. Well, if you hire someone to kill one of the most popular people on the planet. Why are you going to use them? Your car. You know, <laughs> you won't go and take that car and then park it in your body shop. Yeah. Like, that just seems insane. Yeah. And that part, too. Yeah. And I'm like, and that's not where I had his cars at. I had it at a spot in, um, in Arlita. Yeah. A storage there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, crazy story. I mean, we'll, we'll never know because Pucci ultimately got killed. Yes. You know, uh, a few years later, I think. Uh, probably in 2099 or 2000, something like that. Yeah. So about three years later. Yeah. He got killed. I mean, Suge's not going to admit to his involvement in that, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, it's just one of these things where I, I could honestly say I don't really know who killed Biggie. It could be there's too many, too many different options, none of which I have a, a really good feeling about. I always thought it was the South Side Compton Crips that, that did it. Yeah. For, for, I mean, for payment. they were there. Yeah. Keefe was there. I think Orlando was Orlando was there. Uh, Keefe was definitely there. Keefe was definitely there. Keefe I think he said, there. yeah, Keefe says Orlando and Dre was there. Okay, yeah. there you go. Yeah. So like I'm saying, there's too many options. Yeah. There's there's absolutely too many different options, and I don't I don't really know. So I think that's one of these things that's going to end up as a conspiracy theory, and, right. and that's going to be the end of that. Um, I interviewed Malik Lee, who was Snoop's okay. bodyguard. Yes. Were you around during Snoop's trial? Uh, oh, well, doing the trial. The murder yes, trial. Yes, that was me and the security that was, that was always with Snoop was two security that worked for me. Okay. But yes, we was around by that time. Okay. Well, when the actual shooting happened, were you around? No. Okay, funny. you came later. I came later. That's why I came in because they were, you know, getting sued because, you know, they were good with having homeboy securities and people like that around. But when you, a $100 million, $200 million company, and you start seeing the liability mm -hmm. that comes along. They still had to pay out four and a half million dollars uh, to that family, or okay. a, a crazy amount. I, I don't want to say the, the now because I don't know what it was, but it was a crazy amount. They still had to pay out for the liability part yeah. because of Malik not being, uh, you know, certified. And he wasn't certified to carry a gun and all that. Oh, he wasn't. No. Oh, okay. He didn't mention that so in our interview. They had a, you know, so they still had to pay out. Oh, so that, that, that was type part of, of money. The, part of the thing. And that's what, you know, hurt hurt the liability on the company. Now, there were stories, you know, as we were, you know, when we did the interview, I had mentioned this because I remember reading about it, was there were stories that, you know, the guys were associated with the guy who got killed, you know, they were like threatening you know, Snoop and Suge and everything else like that. There was also stories, on the other hand, saying that Death Row was threatening some of the witnesses and and so forth. Like, how how bad was that situation during the I trial and so forth? I remember Nate Dogg and I were at a, uh, it was out there, quote unquote, Mary J. Mary J. Black concert, where somehow I got stuck with Nate Dogg that night because it was just us. Sharita went with us, uh, Suge, um, we went to the concert, but then she didn't want to go to the after party. It was the after party. So me and they dog went to the after party. And it was some guys from whatever gang out with the Shoreline Village or some Venice Village or I forget what gang. And they were starting to pick pick on Nate Dog. And I remember Nate Dog going to his trunk and me and we had to pull down on some of those guys that were starting him that night. And luckily, you know, we got out of there uns unscathed. And you know, no gunplay, other than pointing, uh, went down. So we had incidents like that with them whenever we saw them out and about. And but the threatening of the witness come from my guys. Um, two of the guys, um, and I hopefully talked about. It. I haven't read the book yet, but there's a book out by uh, this guy they call Fred Reynolds, Sergeant Reynolds, that Keefe D always referred to. That they was working for me and David Kenner asked us to find a witness that he needed for the deposition. They had him in hiding, the DA office. Mm -hmm. My guys found him. Okay. Goes there with, you know, with their badges and stuff and, and serve him the subpoena. The DA investigator was furious behind that. <laughs> 
especially when he found out it was cops that served him. Yeah. And that's why my guy's work permit ultimately got pulled once the chief of police found out, you know, my guys was doing that. That's it was just the, the straw in the hat to make him finally pull out work permits. But um that's where they get with the threatening the witness comes out, is because they came and served them a subpoena for a deposition for David Kenner. Uh-huh. Got that it. they had in hiding. And ultimately, uh, Snoop and Malik ended up uh, being that case. Correct. Yeah. And Great Malik, defense attorney. Yeah. And Malik ended up kind of parting ways with Snoop at that point. Yeah, I heard his version of why he did it. Wait, you watched the interview? Yeah. Okay. I watch a lot of your interviews, Lad. Thank you. Thank um, you. I don't agree with that. I just think that um, by that time, you know, Suge had my security guys around, and they knew the liability. And uh, Malik was known for good for being, I think, in karate or something like that, as I remember them talking about him. But it was mainly because his job was really replaced by retired or off-duty police officers. Well, I mean, you look at Death Row now. Uh, isn't it owned by a toy company now <laughs> or no. something? No, actually they sold it. E1 sold it. E1 has been sold. I still, you know, do some work for E1. Okay. So it's another company that owns E1 now. Okay. But so, now Hallsboro doesn't own right, okay. E1 anymore. So so Death Row is basically a legacy brand now. It's it's really uh, what they call it. Uh, it used to be a word. I don't forgot it. But like Capital Records used to be where it just sell, selling um, old, old material. Yeah. And then, like they're trying to promote or start a new artist. They're not trying to blow anybody up. Yeah. We actually, uh, I did an interview a while back with uh, the journalist Ture uh, about a situation he had uh, trying to interview Suge Knight. And um, uh, an artist uh, that we work with uh, actually created an animation of the interview. <laughs> Have you ever seen it? No, I didn't see that one. I'm gonna I'm gonna play it for you real quick. But Shug, we could talk about Shug. Um, I was really trying to get on at the New Yorker, so I told them like, let's do a story on Dick Griffey. For those who don't know, Dick Griffey was a big record label owner from like the '70s, early '80s, and he had mentored Shug, but he was he was suing Shug. So I'm hanging out with Dick for like, you know, two, three weeks. I'm like, you know, oh, let's go see Suge. So I'm like, it'd be so great for the story. Let's go hang out with Suge. And he's finally like, all right, you want to go see Suge? All right, fine. Let's go see Suge. 10, 11 o'clock at night, we go out to death row. We go into Suge's office, uh, you know, and Suge's giving us a little tour. Dick leaves. So I start interviewing Suge and I'm interviewing him about Dick Griffey. We go for about 40 minutes on just the rise of Dick and their relationship and the mentoring and Dick was big on owning your masters and not having a slave mentality and he had he had incepted Shug with that. So, you know, I'm feeling myself. We're vibing. Everything is good. And so I'm like, you know, what's up with the lawsuit? And Shug says, uh, what are you talking about? And Everything changed. His whole mood changed. The whole room seemed to change. And now he's clearly upset. And I'm like, you know, it's cool. And I like grab my tape recorder and he's like, nah, sit there. And I'm like, oh, what is this about to be? So then he goes to the door. There's only one door out of there. And he calls his man. And he just looks like he's just ready to go beat somebody's ass and he just kill anybody. I'm like, I am not ready for any of this action. Suge is, you know, saying shit, he won't come in here, talk about lawsuits. And the young thug is like, let me at him. And, but he was just like, nah, I'm, I'm just scaring him. I'm not telling you to go kill him, but I'm... So the, the young thug is waved off. So I go to grab the tape recorder again and walk out and he goes, where are you going? Sit down. And I'm like, fuck, we're not done. And he goes, rewind the tape to the beginning. And I'm like, oh, fuck, now I'm gonna lose my interview and I came here for nothing. And then he starts to give me the same interview again, but he's answering the same questions and giving 
the same answers for 40 minutes in order, which is very, very hard to do. Uh, most people could not do that. And then when we got to the part where I asked him about the the lawsuit, he was like, all right, shut the tape recorder off. All right, you got your interview. Get out of here. And I'm like, Dick, let's go. We're, we're out of here. I didn't I didn't get hit, and I got the interview. Uh, great animation. Yeah, right? shout out to, to my man, Mike McCraw. He's one of the animators at uh, Bob's Burgers. Okay. Uh, he also did the, the Soldier Boy animation, for those who've seen it. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, Ture is not a guy that usually exaggerates or lies or whatever else. When you see this story laid out does this sound like something that was happening at death row yeah um i mean Shug memory is like that great storyteller and it has a, i always call him an actor as i say he'd be acting the way he is. he's really not that person that we always see he learned from other people and um because he's really a good guy in my opinion and so that's why I always call him an actor because he'd be acting like the tough guy. And so I can see the last part of that animation being true. He was furious with Dick Griffey and DOC for the lawsuit. He was. It hurt him, really, uh, in his mind because he felt Dre and him were the ones that really created everything. Mm -hmm. um, Dick Griffey, what he always told me, would tell him hard stuff. That's how he got his masters from Interscope. Because most people don't know, the Chronic, not D cover, not the song D cover, 187 on Undercover Cop, but the song Dre Day, I guess it was, the first one, yeah. was done without a contract, without a deal with Interscope. So he kind of had them by, you know, he had them in a good position where they needed Snoop for the, the upcoming album. And he could request whatever he wanted. And Dick Griffey used to always tell him all these crazy things to ask for that he couldn't get when he was rolling Solar Records with Sony. And sure enough, Jimmy and Ted Fields acquiesced and gave it because they knew Doggy Style was going to be a big album. And they had no, and sure could have took that, that album anywhere because they didn't have any paperwork. They had like a one-off with them with the Chronic. Uh -huh. And so... That's why Interscope pretty much gave him stuff that nobody got in the 90s. Gotcha. By owning their own master, especially a black label. Yeah, Master P did it also. We're well, talking about 96, later. 97. Yeah, later on, yeah. And he paid 80%. Well, he paid all his bills mm -hmm. and, and gave up 20%. Where Suge deal was 50-50, you pay for everything. Mm-hmm. And then we recoup it, and then we get 50%. So that's why Shield was able to have all the high-budget videos, all that unlimited studio time and all that, because he had somebody cutting the check. Uh -huh. So which deal is better? A deal where we can spend as much as we want or, you know, where we can mutually agree upon. You, you pay everything. You my bank. And then we recoup a lot of it. You know, you will recoup your money back. But then we split everything 50% down the line. Which deal is better? Master P deal was 80-20. He bring everything, pay for everything, yeah. and he paid 20% yeah. to well, distribute. I'm just talking about Master P got to keep his masters as well. I got you. Yeah. Now, now, but the whole thing of bringing people in to scare people and stuff like that, was that a sugar way of functioning? I, I have seen incidents where that has happened. Yeah. But it's generally where people, in his mind, was picking on him or agitating him. Hmm. Um, Got it. In his mind. Well, That's one how of, he took it. Well, one of the deep dives uh, was the, the urine drinking incident. <laughs> uh, so no urine actually got drank, but basically they, they had a guy that was doing some work for both death row. That's the stretch guy, too. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the stretch boy. guy, the guy goatee. Oh, well, I don't understand. You'll see it. You'll catch it when we when you read interview. I mean, when you re listen back to it, the big stretch guy. Yeah, that you said. Um, that I said that get got a nice embracing. The goatee guy. Uh huh. Is the big stretch guy. 
Okay. Okay. So so essentially, there was a party, and you know they they tr- they had a guy that worked with both Puffy and and Death Row, and they tried to get him to say where Puffy's family lived and everything else like that. They beat him up real bad. Tupac was there, and I guess they went to. Dre was there. Don't forget Dre. Uh, Dre was there as well. And uh, I guess at one point, they, they tried to get the guy to drink some urine, but I guess the urine spilled and the guy ended up- It, it spilled, yeah. Escape. Uh, were you there at all or no? I was outside the door. Oh, you were- Wait, you were outside that door? I was outside the door. I was the one that after- uh, Well, I was there when the, when the police walked by the guy and he kept going. I was in that group. Um, and that didn't happen. I was the guy who went out to New York with David Kenner when he signed off the agreement for six hundred thousand dollars. So he settled for six hundred thousand. Six hundred thousand, what he got? So he took an ass whooping for six hundred thousand. I would have took it. Okay, but that actually happened. That happened. Uh, the the funny thing about it is, in the agreement and with the statements, he said Shug never touched him. It was Dre. <laughs> each one of them got two hundred dollars, two hundred thousand. So it was two hundred thousand each. It was Dre got sued for two hundred thousand. Well, that's how the settlement read for Dre part, for Pox part, and somebody else's part. I forget who the other person was. It wasn't Shug. Oh, Shug. Because he yeah. he exonerated Shug from the whole thing. Why? Because he was scared. He could, no. Shug was on probation then. Oh. And that violation that he got a year later. For allegedly kicking Orlando Anderson. There's no legend about it. It's on tape. The judge said it took him 13 times before he judged that it was a uh, a kick. Okay. All right. All right. It is what it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so that actually happened. So you're outside this door while someone getting their ass kicked inside? Like, uh, were yeah, you hearing hearing it and everything? I didn't hear what was going on inside. Okay. But um, um, matter of fact, Sharita came and got me and told me to go in there and clear it out. And that's when they really started clearing it out. Uh-huh. It's because they realized I was coming around and so. Okay. Yeah. So so these stories are are true. I but that, mean, that that happened. Were there any other urine drinking situations? Oh, wait a minute, I don't know about the urine stuff. I'm <laughs> talking about the incident inside I and what the that. guys signed for. Right. Yeah. But but I mean everyone focused on the urine part. I mean yeah. I guess that's some jailhouse shit where if you really want to demean well, a man, you. DOC can. told you about him liking to. Uh, Urine on people, don't you remember? Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> yeah, I guess Shug got a urine thing going on. <laughs> it is what it is. Shug was a big kid. He's a deviant. You know what I mean? Like, he used to tell stories about pissing on football's players' legs in the shower and thought that was just the funniest shit in the world. <laughs> you know, when I heard that, uh, I mean, I think Mob James mentioned in our last interview that Shug is still, like, buying women cars, and he, he's doing okay in prison. Yeah, I'm not aware. He buying motherfucking women's cars from prison. He bought a woman a car from prison. Uh, uh, yeah, he buying women cars from prison. Okay. So, where do you think he getting his money from? Well, if he's doing it, it's your people helping you. Uh, Nick Cannon <laughs> and uh, Ray J and that Ray J. Yeah. yeah. Hey man, listen, Sugar Sugar always seems to find an angle. I told you when he settled down in there, and finally decide. You're going to write a book or a movie or tell the truth? Somebody's going to come and pay him right. WAC 100 had $30 million deals on the on the table for him when he was trying to get him bailed out of jail. Mm-hmm. Shug Knight kept messing those deals up. There was people out there willing to give up money at that time. I done met with two or three different producers about doing shows and TV and series and stuff for him, you know, consulting and helping out and and she'll always mess them up. How do you mess up a deal like that? Start demanding more. Start bad mouthing people that putting it in place. That's what happened with him and Wack. You know, he ch- try to take over. The, you know, you bring something to the table, and then he want to bad mouth you to get you out the way, and so he can get the uh, situation and control the situation and beat him out. There's book deals that he done signed. You ever seen the book come out? Well, you know, yeah. got million uh, dollar advances on. Well, I interviewed, uh, I believe, Matt Barnes, who had a deal uh-huh. with Suge and Death Row of some sort. Yeah. And then once he started to try to 
you know, actually start the production. You find out that there was other deals that had already been signed and whatever. Oh. And at that point, he just said, let me just take my losses exactly. and move forward, smart, you know, with my life. Man. You actually own the life rights to Suge Knight? No, so I was a part of a pro, uh, a project that we did current or we we did have the rights to uh, through his niece, uh, but it just kind of started getting messy. The further and further it went down, I uh, ended up hooking them up with messy uh, business with Suge Knight. Really, right, I've never heard of that before. I ended up hooking them up <laughs> with uh, with Mark Kenton, the creative power, and, and and had these guys all excited about doing the story. And then you know, once this shit got real, there was. You know, so and so needs this amount of money, and so and so needs that amount of money, and now someone else is because we didn't get this. Someone else has the right, so it just kind of got messy. Uh, so I just respectfully had to, to to back away from that project. Yeah, smart man. Yeah, but I that's mean, what happened. But I told everybody, wait, let the man do about ten years in prison. Yeah, settle down, get older, and then he'd be ready. And his, and if he tell it. Right, which a lot of people know the a lot of the truth, so he can't lie too much. I mean, he gonna have Dre doing table dancing and saying him and Bruce was doing this and doing that all the time, and Snoop running and. He, but if he just tell the truth about him and do it right, it'd be a great story. Well, but right now he will clown everybody. Yeah, I mean, he did a documentary though. Uh, I thought he did uh, great. America's with, Nightmare, I think. But they had to stop with that. Uh, Fuqua. Uh, Antoine Fuqua, yeah. And it was pretty good, but you could tell it was just unfinished. And they just threw it out because Suge got convicted. Because he got no, it wasn't that. They stopped. They stopped messing with each other. Oh, really? You, yeah. You remember HBO or Showtime. somebody was supposed to? Showtime, Showtime was supposed Showtime, to yeah. did it, and they they stopped production on it. Well, Showtime put it out. Well, eventually, eventually, after he went to jail, it was like, all prison, right. <laughs> yeah, there's no way to salvage this thing anymore. Yeah, might as well just throw it out there. Yeah. I had a deal with him with Dick Clark Productions. Okay. And they just shot a, like a little pilot just to show their executives. And he was tripping on the house that they had for him to show their exec. I was like, sure, this is just for the executives, man. He was going to get $15,000 a month, which was, this is what I'm talking um, Oh, 2006, 2007 or something like that. I had left and came back. It might have been 2009, 2008. Well, we needed $5,000, $15,000 a month or whatever. Yeah. It was going to be Fuse. He's going to be the face of Fuse Network. They oh. had it. A deal worked out. Yeah, I mean, you hear these stories all the time. I mean, when I had Akon on my show, he talked about that whole situation about how she kept pressuring him over, you know, some uh, over detail, de detail, detail, being which was money. my guy. Oh, that was I'm the guy? one that brought detail around, introduced Shook to, de to uh, detail the show. Okay. Which I met through Ray J because I was dealing with Ray J at the yeah. time and Ray J and detail was tight. Yeah. He had did the single for uh, Ray J at the time. But I had a 10 album, de uh, a 10 song deal with detail uh -huh. that I had paid this guy that I used to deal with from uh, Colorado named Randall, um, Big Randall, that paid him some money to do things. Shook took that like he owned it. <laughs> because Detail was excited, wanted to meet Shook, so I used to bring him around Shook. I, had left, I hadn't been around Shook, but then he, like he owned Shook, Detail. Well, yeah, and that whole situation ended badly for Shook. You know? Uh, had some kids go to rob him at his house, Detail. You know, magic. He went and robbed him, took stuff from him. It was all on the news and stuff from uh, from detail. It's a mess. Everything's a mess. Yeah, I mean, Suge, some people just self-sabotage. And Suge, unfortunately, is one of those people that people want to work with him and people want to do things with him. You know, listen, if Suge was a regular guest on Vlad TV, like everyone would win. Like I would be able to cut him a you check. You have to edit <laughs> your video a hundred times before it came out. Right. And that's what I'm saying though. But like I've never done business with Suge yeah. because I just, everyone I know that's done business with Suge tells me a bad story. So why would I just, why would I go down this route knowing the track record? It's probably going to end badly for me one way or another. Or I'm going to, you know, it's not that I'm scared to do it, but I know I'm probably going to end up wasting my time and money and, and get well, frustrated along the way. It'd be good doing it in prison. <laughs> if you can get into prison and do it, I'll say do it right now and today. Yeah, but, he, but well, look at how many other deals he has going on. 
yeah. at the time. You know what I'm saying? Like you mentioned the Nick Cannon, the Ray J stuff. Like yeah, yeah. God knows if we did an interview, if this somehow steps on someone's toe of a deal that he already signed and I get a cease and desist or you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like it's one of those things where it's not a, a fear thing at all. It's just that I know that I'm going to be stepping on a whole bunch of okay. nonsense. Let me just say this. this to people out there. There's one to do deals with him. Cause I hear Herb Gotti trying to do something with him now and right. all that. Um, if you ain't going through toy, he came on my show on Bumble. That's the one thing he came on oh, after sure? the Ray J and the uh, Nick Cannon came out. He gave me some audio. He didn't actually think, but he gave me a tape okay. statement saying, "If you come, matter of fact, matter of fact, I called and offered it to you to put it out on your show." The exclusive where he said, "Toy is the person that you contact." You remember it came out on TMZ later, uh, I, I but think right so, before. Yeah. But then I think. You passed. You yeah, said I passed you had considered it, and then you said, "Reggie, I ain't I'm, getting in the shit night." I'm not, I'm not getting yeah. in the shit night business. Yeah. I'm and just not. I'm I'm just not. Yeah, man. Listen, we we we've done we've done so much, you know, a, a, around them, but it's kind of like, yeah. I mean, even getting audio from him, I felt was was going to be potentially problematic. Let me tell you, he's charismatic. Yeah. Um, you would like him yeah. until. He's done with you. Once you're done with him, that's when it usually go like that. Something happened. You couldn't make something happen that you promised him, and then that's when it go over. But generally, he um, if he's dealing with you, if he's dealing with you straight up, you can't be dealing with another man. With you, it got to be a female involved for it to go right. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, listen, Shug, Shug knows who I am. Yeah. You oh, know I mean? oh I've, of course. I've, I've I've talked to people who talk to him. And my name comes up. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and that's fine. You know, I stand behind everything that I do. Uh, you know, hopefully Suge will do his time. Uh, he'll end up living through this very lengthy sentence. So as well. And he'll come out. And, you know, hopefully he'll embrace, you know, being a good businessman. Because I think that he could do a lot of good business as a good businessman. You well, know he got 14 years. He got 14 years of thinking and mature. 14 more years? 14 more years. I always told y'all it's going to be 70 when he gets out. He's going to be 70 when he gets out. He's going to be 70. He's not going to be, be, you know, he's not going to be able to physically push people around at that point. You know, he'll be an old man. Just like he learned in 2001 when he came home. There'd be laws on the books where you can't do that, where we didn't have terrorist threats in 95 and 94. Because we would have been in jail a long time in 95, 95 for terrorist threats, which in 2001. Yeah. You yeah. had that, so. I mean, ultimately, between uh, threatening F. Gary Gray, taking that one woman's camera, along with the Tams parking lot yeah. situation, that really what what did him in. But yeah. really, those other two situations weren't that serious. Correct. Ultimately, you're not going to get 28 years for sending someone a threatening text oh, message, correct. you know, or correct. taking a camera. Correct. It's just that, yeah, you throw it all Unfortunately, together. Unfortunately, when you have a two strikes. In a state, well, you, of, are, you already strike, have, though. yeah, you have yeah. two strikes, and uh, yeah, that's what it is, man. So, hopefully, uh, he'll do his time. Hopefully, some projects will come out. I- I'm interested in the story, um, you know. In, in fact, uh, that one British guy just did a, a documentary about him, Broomfield. Yeah, I thought it was kind of mediocre. Yeah, I well, watched it, it just only on I, YouTube. So, well, no, it was on uh, I bought it, it was on, on YouTube like, on Amazon, I think. Oh, did you? Yeah, I believe it was on Amazon, Amazon okay. Video. Yeah, so you know, you can watch it. Um, you it know, was okay. Nothing really new got brought to the table on that. Let me let me talk about that. Okay. The females in there, she made it seem like, but she never said it. She knew she. That was a lady that Broomfield did on the Green Reaper case. That is his go-to girl in L.A. Okay. We had never met that young lady before in life. Right. She, she didn't really see like she had anything She never to do. said that either, though. Yeah. I kind of was hoping she said it. I was waiting. For her to say that, but she never said that. She just talks about him, yeah. which things that anybody that w- w- you know that don't like shit will come up with that yeah. with that opinion. Um, and so that was the one thing I love the pictures that was in the yeah. that they saw. Those some unseen pictures mm-hmm. that I know where they came from because I gave them to his daddy, and so the niece Crystal uh, is the one that went through his his stuff and. And put out those pictures. Mm-hmm. Uh, they call her Wild Thing, uh, but she was in the, the the video a little bit talking about her uncle Shell, which 
I love how she have all the opinions about Tupac and everything. And she probably was six years old. That <laughs> 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 just that just make me laugh when I say people that knew so much when they were six years old. But that was Norris Anderson's daughter and mm -hmm. Shook's sister Karen's daughter, which um yeah. he did love. He do love a lot. Yeah, man. Listen, I hope he does his time and he gets out and he lives out the rest of his days in peace and quiet because he's had enough drama <laughs> through the course of his life to last 10 lifetimes. You know? We'll see how that prison system works, right? Yeah, we'll see how it works. Yeah. Well, Reggie Wright Jr., man, appreciate you coming in. Uh, you know, you're in a wheelchair right now and you're recovering, but you're still here. Exactly. You could have died oh, yeah. in that hospital. And, uh, you know, you're now vaccinated. Like I am um, as well, you know, so everyone out there realized that if Reggie was vaccinated when this happened, it probably would have just been a headache and a few bad days yeah, as right. opposed to two months of coma and potentially being taken off life support yes. and, and having to do the physical therapy and, and, you know, the tracheotomy, you can still see the, the, the hole in your throat and yeah. so forth. Um, you know, it is very dangerous out there and, and everyone should, should protect themselves, uh, you know, but you made it through and you're okay and you're improving and i'm happy for that you know and hopefully you'll reunite with the gangster chronicles at one point because i'd like to hear you guys together as well we'll see how, how life plays out we'll see till next time thank Peace. you thanks Lat.